Hi, Phil Aston here from Now Spinning Magazine with another podcast. And again, it's a pleasure to welcome back Martin Popoff, musicologist and fantastic rock and roll author to many, many um, books indeed. And this is our second video together. The first one, of course, we looked at our top 10 current Deep Purple albums. And we got some fantastic responses to, the, to that. This one is a little bit different. And it's a, it's my thought that Rick Derringer is the bridge between Ronnie Montrose and Eddie Van Halen. So I just want to give a little bit of background to why I feel this way. In the early 70s, I was a young teenager and I was listening to Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, um, Status Quo, Wishbone Ash, Slade, T-Rex, all of them, all of the names that I'm mentioning are all UK bands, all of them. And so everything to me to do with rock music came out of the UK. I know there was Jimi Hendrix, um, obviously from the US, but to me, and you have to imagine being a 14, 15 year old kid, that anything prior to 1970, when you're that age, was like 100 years ago. I know there was Leslie West, but I haven't found him. So I can't really say that. But when the first Montrose album appeared, and the first time in the UK we were even aware that this band existed was for, with two reasons. One, they appeared on the Old Grey Whistle Test, which was a UK-based late-night music show, which made everyone in the school uh, playground talk about it. And they supported Status Quo on their Quo Tour in 1974. And when that album was bought by, I think, a friend's older brother, it was just like riff after riff after riff. And when you're like 14, 15, riffs are everything to do with rock music. And it was just fantastic. And so the excitement of that Christmas 74 when the new Montrose album was coming out was just tangible. But it wasn't the same as the first album. And after that, Ronnie always wanted to experiment and didn't want to repeat himself. But of course, when you're a young rock fan, you want your idols to repeat themselves because you want more space station number fives that's when i suddenly encountered a guitarist called rick derringer and to me he's the bridge between montrose and Eddie van halen because not necessarily because of his guitar chops or whatever but because of his guitar sound and his approach to rock music and he was from the us of a and so he was the someone else from across the pond from where i was that was playing music that was exciting and of course he produced they only come out at night by a Egwick, Egwinter group which of course Ronnie Montrose was on so it made me wonder whether they'd kind of telepathically joined together and of course the first album All American Boy had some great songs on it and of course Rick Derringer is not just a guitar slinger he's a singer songwriter and I think that through this period from 73 to 78 when Eddie Van Halen arrived, he was the one, maybe with the guy from Cheap Trick as well, because I think Rick Derringer definitely tapped into the Cheap Trick vibe um, that glued those two cornerstones of American rock guitar, in my mind, together. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, I, it's it's interesting to compare the UK centric view and the North American view. So th the first thing I want to say as an umbrella uh, statement is that I don't think there is a guitar hero, period, between Jimi Hendrix all the way to Eddie Van Halen, because I think of the way these guys were talked about in the press. I mean, granted, you know, a uh, here, I'll, I'll, I'll flash a few props here. So, uh you know what? I'm 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 going to show things. None of this will be from the U.S. Just to start things okay. off to get the yeah. ball rolling. So, I think if I was to pick a choice at all for a guitar hero between Jimmy and Eddie, I would say Richie Blackmore is one guy that gets talked about. Um, so when I say gets talked about, uh, I I feel like when people in the press talked about Deep Purple in the '70s, it was equal parts, the entire package and Richie Blackmore. So yes, uh, he, he is spoken as a guitar hero, but people didn't dwell on his, his solos, for example, uh, over and over. I mean, in a live situation, definitely that this thing got kind of, you know, elongated and more pronounced. Let me see who else I got here. So actually the only other one I've pulled out here is Jimmy page. So 
Jimmy Page has definitely talked about that way again. Um, but still, Led Zeppelin is even more than Deep Purple is talked about as the whole package. Actually, I've got one more. Uh, where do we go here? I've got one more uh, non. Uh, let's see. Where did I put it? Yes. So here's the only other guy I think of. Oh, yeah, um, Shanker, yeah. You know, in terms of uh, non-U.S., so Michael Schenker, but UFO wasn't that famous a band. But but when you talked about UFO, you definitely talked about Michael Schenker. But it wasn't it wasn't the uh, you know alien descended from another planet that Jimi Hendrix was that everybody talked about, and all those apocryphal you know quotes about everybody going back to the woodshed and scaring the bejesus out of Eric Clapton and Pete Townsend and all that sort of stuff, right? Um, and Jeff Beck, of course, as well. Um, but uh, so, yeah, you. Know, I'll, I'll stop there. I, I have a bunch of American stuff to talk about there uh, here, but may, maybe tell me a little bit more about your sort of feelings about what both Ronnie and Rick Derringer brought, and 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 what the link. Is. I think uh, obviously I'm a massive Richie Blackmore fan, and, and Deep Purple are probably they are my favorite band. So I always championed Richie Blackmore in the playground next to Jimmy Page or Tony Omi or, or whatever. And the the older the older kids were obviously into Hendrix and stuff like that. Obviously, as I as I went through life, I realised that Hendrix had done was wasn't following anybody, and it was obviously a complete genius. But Blackmore was always you know a forefront, and all the people you've mentioned, you know Jimmy Page, Led Zeppelin. I think there's also a thing that when you are a rock fan, that you always want to try and discover something that your friends don't really know a lot about everyone was always saying what have you discovered what have you heard and of course in in those days before the internet before youtube it was something where you took a chance in a record shop uh, and you found something and you came home and played it and you, you said to your mates have you heard of blah and they go no um but i think that montrose was 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 such an uh, such a different album because there was almost something about rock bands in those days where it was almost like they didn't want to do 10 rock tracks. They felt like that's too much. Maybe there's got to be the ballad. There's got to be the, the more off the wall track and even purple were like this in a way, apart from machine it perhaps, but everything was kind of, there was different flavors. Whereas I think now with heavy metal bands, they'll do 10 heavy metal tracks of various different speeds um but back then it was quite unusual for a band to do an all-out rock album without something being there that was slightly different and ronnie montrose of course never repeated this again but on that first montrose album every track was riff driven and 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 was a template of the, lyrically about growing up timeless stuff the vocalist and sammy hager everything was just in its place um and so after that I kind of was was intrigued by the USA, like a lot of people in the, the UK, always looking across the Atlantic to the romanticism of America and music coming out of it, but wanting something that was hard rock. Um, but I think that Rick Derringer kind of started to do that. One of the – he was also – I just want to point out that visually, when he first appeared on those Johnny Winter and albums, uh, there's a, the live one, he looks about 50 years of age in the gatefold. But then within um, two, a year, he appeared looking like, you know, a glam rock star, you know, and and, and very much the business, really. And, of course, and later on, he, he looked totally, like, very glam on some of these albums. But it was this one, um, which is Live in Cleveland, which where he does those kind of solo pieces, which there was only really Richie Blackmore who did that on the Burn tour, uh, just a solo piece. And it made me wonder when I heard that, was Eddie Van Halen, was he in the audience? Did he get his, some of his inspiration from the eruption track from what Rick was doing? I think Rick, because he'd come up from the McCoys and he was he made it when he was 16, 17, he was a pop star. I think I felt that Rick Derringer was a bit like Ronnie Montrose, this is why I see this the resemblance, was putting his toes into shall I be a shall I be a hard rock guitarist or shall I be a pop rock star? And he, he, all through his career, he was flipping from one side to the other. But amongst all of that, I feel he left a, a legacy that's very underrated in that period. And that's why I feel that 
you know, albums like Derringer and Sweet Evil with, uh, you know, Carmen and Peachy's brother on were like, a for- are they like a forgotten part of the jigsaw as America started to, well, in the 80s, of course, became the dominant force in hard rock. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Well, um, yeah, I'll I'll talk a little bit about the the American side of it then as well. So starting with uh with your premise and, and the beginning of all this. So yeah, it's funny. Um I I also believe that um I was just talking to Billy Gibbons yesterday. I had an interview with him and, wow. and you know, one brief little bit of it, I talked about the British blues boom. And uh, and when Jim Simpson, you know, is booking uh, bands into into his uh, his club in Birmingham, you know, talking about how it suddenly got kind of boring. Right. Um, And then and then, you know, we had this nice classical based doomy new new music out of the UK and the blues boom uh, kind of uh, carried over a little. It had a hangover with Mountain and Cactus and and Ted Nugent and and all this stuff. So so America didn't go the classical route. And Billy had kind of a cool answer about that. But so I I consider this to be the first American heavy metal album, period. And it took a long time. It's 1973 at this point. So so Montrose, and then they do this one. There's a, my my scrappy radio copy of that, and then and then this was pretty heavy, and this actually is kind of deep purpley, right? With yeah, it is. Yeah, and all yeah, that. black train and that. Yes. Yeah. So so first off, I'll say that um, I don't. I never really looked at Ronnie Montrose as a guitar hero. A um, couple of things that do link him to Eddie in a big way is that he was a massive gearhead. He loved gear. He loved tinkering, inventing, you know, effects pedals and and playing with his guitars and stuff. So that was important. Um, plus, you know, it's it's the name of the band. I wrote a whole chapter in my Van Halen book comparing like twenty different things between that Montrose album, and the first Van Halen. Van Halen loved that album. They almost loved it so much that that they covered every band under the sun but i don't think they i believe how the story goes is they never covered a single song off that montrose album which is pretty wild wow. right um so that's important um but really i i've always considered ronnie just a great riff writer and a great songwriter obviously he's not a singer just like eddie um so so I love I love the Montrose canon and I even love even more so the Gamma canon. That's why I wrote a Montrose book and because I included Gamma and it had to have Gamma in it. Um, so that's my first point is that I, I don't think even he's particularly a guitar hero. Now, Rick Derringer. Um, you're right. So uh, so we have the we have the early works, you yeah. know, these kinds of records. Right. Yeah. Um, and then. I love Sweet Evil to Death. I mean, this is basically an Aerosmith album. Um, yes, you know, yes. they're they're on Blue Sky. It's uh, it's Jack Douglas, Jack Douglas right, isn't producing. It? Yeah. Um, you know, I always uh, I I I just in our little email group, I I fantasized about this, but uh, I was I was jogging around the other day and listening to Sitting on the Pool with that whole intro and that and that beautiful. Yeah. And I'm thinking, wow, wouldn't wouldn't that have been amazing if Led Zeppelin at O2 would have opened up with Sitting by the Pool? It's so Jimmy Page, right? <laughs> that that thing that he does there right um but so with rick derringer you have that um you know the big difference between him and and eddie is that he is a singer so he's like a singer uh you know player uh, a writer and he had this complicated past and all this but i don't think people over here really thought of him as a guitar hero much either i love this album to death this is where it gets a little poppy it's derringer really only in name um because the band has changed quite a bit here do you feel um, do you feel that he was really listening to a lot of cheap trick as well as around that time yes and then the other interesting thing about that is that when you get to this album yeah. Um, he's got the two heaviest songs on here. It's both of them, right? The yeah. two heaviest songs on here are written by Rick Nielsen and only Rick Nielsen. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's amazing. This is this is quite a poppy album, but um, it must be love and yeah, I need a little girl are yeah. storming heavy metal tracks. Uh, by the way, I wanted to mention I love how you UK guys um Use the word rock, uh, a rock <laughs> album, rock songs and stuff. We don't do that over here for heavy metal, right? When you say rock, you kind of mean hard rock and heavy metal. And I know you use heavy metal and hard rock too, but it's it's interesting. We never say that about, oh, they made a rock album, right? <laughs> kind of thing. It's funny. Um, but so Rick Derringer, again, I feel he's very much a Ronnie Montrose. 
in that we think of him as just someone who's come up with these great hard rock songs kind of thing, right? Um, yeah. And just to mention a couple others, so I, I did bring up my Van Halen here, and we could talk a little bit more about Van yeah, Halen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how it's such a big difference. There's our there's our hero there, Eddie. Yeah. Um, but if you want to know a little bit more about maybe the, the North American-centric feeling on this, is that Montrose, not famous at all. Rick Derringer, not really famous at all. I would put these two guys as uh, as guys that are really talked about as oh. guitar heroes a little bit. So Buck Dharma, yeah, and uh, and Ted Nugent. So when people would talk about what, certainly when people would talk about Ted Nugent, I mean his name is on the tin, right? Um, he he sings two fifths of the songs. Um, and, and he, he's very boastful and, and, uh, you know, guitar hero, guitar battles and all this stuff. There's, you know, always pictures of him on the cover. He's got a really distinct, cool look. So he really was framed, uh, you know, the narrative about being a guitar hero, big, big deal there. So you want to talk about the time frame? He really only hits the hits the radar uh, in of fame in 1975. So he's right there in the perfect spot. Um, and then he's big until about 78, which is exactly when Van Halen starts, February 10th, 78. Yeah, that's, right? a, that's a really good point. I think yeah. Ted Nugent for me in the UK was uh, the Free For All album. So it was 76 yeah. when he really hit with yeah. Dog Eat Dog. It was a single that the Sounds newspaper gave its single of the week. Um, punk was just around the corner, but they were still championing anything that sounded like a, a, a rock song. And hearing that, uh, a lot a lot of people bought um, Free For All. And of course, that's the one with Meatloaf on the vocals. So the vocals are also seen as, um, you know, very strong. But it's obviously Street Rats, Hammer Down. Um, you know, there's some fantastic stuff on there, isn't there? There really is. Yeah. And Bluest Occult for for me, us in the UK for my peer group was On Your Feet or On Your Knees. Live albums uh, was the first one um, yeah. that that really got pushed over here by the labels. Um, things like Secret Treaties, which would be one of my favourites now. Um, no, I didn't know anyone who had it. We'd all we all kind of arrived with the live one. And I didn't really like um, the one with the hit single on with all the cowbell at the time. It was um, Secret Treaties where I re where I re-emerged with them, which again was 78. Uh, and Aerosmith were kind of bubbling in the background, bands like that. But when the first Van Halen album arrived, uh, which again, most the only reason I bought that or, or heard it was because Black Sabbath were uh, and announced their 10th anniversary tour. The support band was something called Van Halen. And so one of my friends went out to buy it to see what it was. And um, we were playing it on the way to a pub in Birmingham. And no one said a word. And in fact, we just sat in the car and just listened to the whole thing, even when we got to our destination, because we'd never heard anything like it. Uh, yeah. And of course, there was that other connection, which Tem Ted Templeman, you know, he made the Montrose album sound like it was recorded last Tuesday. And, uh, of course, he did the same thing with the first Van Halen album. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it just changed. It changed everything. Yeah. Everything. And and definitely at that point, um, everybody was talking about the guitarist in this band. I mean, there's a song on it called Eruption. I mean, uh, you know, how how uh, how. Um, or a song on it that was a, a guitar solo and it had a name, you know, Eruption. And everybody loved that. And usually that was played on the radio before you got to You Really, uh, you really Got Me. So so they were played in tandem to, they together were, yeah. the way they were on the album. And um, I remember when we first heard that album, uh, as a new release, we knew it was coming. So it was one of the rare times. So I would have been 15. It was one of the rare times when, for some reason, probably saw some advance ads in circus or something like that. We knew it was coming. So when it came out, kind of knew a little bit about it, which is really weird for a 15 year old in rural BC, you know, far from California and all that. Um, but so first heard it um, and uh, absolutely loved it but found it patchy. So the patchiness came from uh, running with the devil, feel your love tonight, Jamie's crying, ice cream man, and whatever the other one I keep forgetting is a uh, little dreamer. Right. Yeah. Um, and then eruption was okay. So it's a guitar. solo. it's amazing. This guy's amazing. There was a cover on it, but what was left? Um, I'm the one atomic punk ain't talking about love. 
and whatever the other one is. I'm on uh, fire. Yeah. I'm yeah. on fire. Yeah. So those ones were like the first, those were so heavy and well put together. It sounded like as cool as a European band. Uh, and you really didn't get that from America. And of course, the guitar solos all over were scorching and, he, and there was this amazing, uh, you know, guitar. And then and and then you saw that the band was called Van Halen and there was a drummer and a, and a guitarist in there. So basically, um, I, I, I definitely have always had it in my head that there's really no actual guitar heroes at all. Uh, between to, to even cause any sort of link. It, it just feels like people talked about Jimi Hendrix and then took the rest of the seventies off until February 10th, 1978, and then talked <laughs> about this new guy. One other point I want to make, which yeah. is kind of interesting. Anytime we talk about guitar heroes is um, the time when there were splits and you never had a guitar hero because there were two guitarists in the band. So, yeah. you know, so nobody really talked, Big time about Joe Perry or Brad Whitford. Uh, other splits were the likes of ACDC, Al um, Angus and Malcolm, Judas Priest, Priest KK yeah. and Glenn, Rolling Stones, you know, Ron Wood and, and Mick or uh, Ron Wood and Keith or Mick and, uh, and Keith. Yeah. Um, Uriah Heap even a little bit, Mick Box, maybe a little Ken Hensley in there, the Flying V and all that. Um, so, yeah, so there were these splits as well. And then and then another thing I wanted to mention is when you think of Prague, we never thought of Guitar Heroes because they were all mousy little librarian sort of guys. You know, Prague was a more ponderous thing. You know, they weren't they weren't wild men. Right. So so you never thought of Steve Howe really as a Guitar Hero or Steve Hackett or any of these guys. Right. And even in King Crimson, you know, the Guitar Hero in that band sat down and played. He's got his little glasses and short hair right Absolutely. Um, you know and, and and other guys along the way um so so yeah Prague never really had guitar heroes either so yeah i i just i just feel like um that, that's the way i've always had it framed in my mind is that is that basically there were bands where the guitarist got a lot of column inches um but it might have only risen to 50 percent of the discussion along the way i, I think the the the, diff, the the montrose um van halen axis is that even though in the in the 70s there were heavy metal bands or bands that were called as heavy metal as the as the term started to become more cemented into mm. the subconscious so to speak there was almost like an apologetic way that a lot of bands, although they said they were a heavy metal band, it was not seen to go out all out and put an album's worth of tracks like that. Even Judas Priest is seen after sin. Again, this is before Van Halen thought, yeah, we're a heavy metal band, but we're going to have the last rose of summer on there. And we're going to, but again, we got, to, there was almost like as if, well, we can't go full on mm -hmm. metal because no one really does that. We've got to have some acoustic right. stuff on there as well. I think Van Halen changed that. Uh, in a way, I know you said these things like Little Dream Run, but they were it was more rock centric and song like Eruption. As I've said, Rick Derringer was doing these solo guitar spots, but probably in that period thought that that doesn't warrant being a track on an album. Um, and so Eddie Van Halen doing Eruption, he wasn't the first guitarist to do a solo guitar spot, Tony Omi had been doing it. And then even actually, to be fair, he had recorded one in the middle of warning off the first Sabbath album, but no one really recorded one and stuck it on the album. They would have thought that's not really the thing to do. And in the UK, Ted Nugent was probably too, too look at me. I'm the best, you know, you know, everyone else doesn't, he's not worthy to come up to my level of guitar excellence. I think in the UK, we were, we were too reserved to kind of take him that seriously, but Eddie Van Halen was quiet just plays the guitar. There was no press to say he was how his ego was behind all of that. We just thought, wow. Um, you know, it was and Montrose, the first album, as I think has re remained where it is because it was literally every song was riff, in come the drums, in come the vocals. It's it, as you say, the first American heavy metal album. And even from the UK, the first full on. Um, album of that type without anything else in the portfolio of tracks that yeah. sounded like it was put on there because maybe we need a bit of light and shade on this. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll say two things about that. So on that topic, yeah, definitely. I, I agree with you. And the ones that are always framed in my mind that way are Rainbow Rising, ACDC, Let There Be Rock and yeah. the Sex Pistols album and then Motorhead. Yeah. Um, so, so those are the ones that were rock solid. We don't need to put a ballad on them. 
uh, kind of things that that I remember moving forward. But Montrose totally fits that, right? But in our in our angry young metalhead mind, if you covered a fifty song, that was just as bad as 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 putting on a ballad. So so we never considered it perfect. Um, but the other thing I, I point I wanted to make is that. Eruption's amazing because you hear the tapping, right? You hear yeah, you hear yeah, this yeah. new thing. Now it's not completely new. Eddie says he got it for a little bit from possibly Jimmy Page, possibly Billy Gibbons. We know Steve Howe. I mean, sorry, Steve Hackett periodically did yeah. tapping. Harvey Mandel did tapping. Um, Carlos Santana, I think there's some tapping going on. Um, but my point is, is that I don't think any of these guitar heroes in the middle had their own sound. They had certain things. Um, you know, Michael Schenker was Teutonic sounding and continental, and so was Richie Blackmore. Michael Schenker, yeah. to me, I always felt Michael Schenker, at least later on, he was this interesting, very tasteful cross between hair metal and Richie Blackmore. Um, but so they both had that Teutonic classical thing. Um, and Buck Darm is an interesting one because I always thought that he had a very subtle sound of his own which was which is more of a lyrical circular melodic very composed style um and ted nugent's a little bit like that as well i think ted nugent is a nice uh link to uh slash um i think i think you hear a lot of ted nugent in slash but really none of those guys and especially ronnie montrose and rick derringer i don't know as a guitarist I, I, I honestly don't hear uh, their own sound, a sound in those guys. And with Eddie, um, you know, you got a bit of it with Eruption. You got a bit of it elsewhere on that album. But moving forward into Two and Women and Children First, he had five or six different things that that composed this sound and you knew it was him. And then he even had the brown sound, you know, this idea of a kind of a production feel as well. But I don't know if you want to speak to that. I mean, who had their sound in the 70s? I think uh, Ted Nugent had quite a there's a lot of chuck berry in his soloing what really there's a lot of that rock and roll kind of rolling stones type you know in in, in his solos um that was quite old in a, in a way and he repeated himself a lot on the way that he started his solos and stuff and i think he'd said somewhere that chuck berry was a major influence but there was that kind of rock and roll kind of uh, you know soloing but of course and also once he realized he got a good feel or a good groove on a song. He he repeated that several times. I think on Stranglehold, he there's a song on um um the one with Meatloaf on, which is almost similar in its Bro, groove. Yeah. Um, and then he did it again on the Weekend right Warriors, the wall, probably. Yeah, that's it. Thinking, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. There's that kind of feel. And you're right that Eddie Van Halen had this sound. Now with Ronnie Montrose getting his own sound, I would say that he did. But it took a long time for him to disengage from the typical Gibson Les Paul through a Marshall Stack type sound. So when you get to Gamma, um, especially Gamma 3, perhaps, um, and um, Speed of Sound with the instrumental songs like Zero G, he has this kind of very sustained, pure sound, which to me, I always recognize as Ronnie Montrose, but I think it took him, uh, well, maybe Mayday or that, that kind of Gamma 2, it starts to develop there where you he gets a different type of sound than he's had through the 70s um and and it's a sound that he used on all his instrumental albums from that point on where to me he he'd found his place um even though his audience was obviously very much more niche than than he was mm -hmm. i think the eddie van halen thing how he changed everything michael schenker contained and still has his unique sound is that it almost like washed away a lot of independent thought in the 80s for heavy metal whereas all the bands that came out of that's probably unfair a lot of the bands that came out of almost like the berkeley school of music all had the same eddie van halen tapping you know four thousand notes he's far better than five uh, approach in you know during that period mm -hmm. yeah so couple points you know i i forgot the fact that ronnie montrose we we can we can give him a little rock hero or guitar hero status because he actually um he was one of the rare guys that actually put out an instrumental uh you know guitar shred album he's one of the early guys you know jeff beck is the big guy in that yeah. field but you know he did put out open fire in in 78 and then did a whole slew of them later on right so that's kind of interesting um two guys we forgot 
Robin Trower and Frank Marino. So we've got the, the two Jimi Hendrix and disciples, Jixi type people, yeah. one from the UK, one from, from Canada, basically. Um, so, so they were, they were kind of considered guitar heroes as well. And, uh, and on your point about, um, you know, the, the copyists or whatever, I think, I think what Eddie did more so is that I, I don't, I don't consider all of those guys that came after so much as copyists in terms of, uh, you know, they all did a lot of tapping or whatever, but I think Eddie started a a tradition of shred, right? That that yeah. word shred, right? So he started the million miles of notes thing, definitely. But to be fair to these other guys, um, you know, Carlos Cavazzo and Randy Rhodes and George oh, Lynch yes, yes, and, yeah. and Warren D. Martini and Jakey Lee, they were all around when Eddie was around. They're all the kind of the same age. So they're not even really followers. They they were they happen to be, you know, building up their craft at the same time. And that was one of the cool things about hair metal is is that you did get a lot of good guitarists. The, the most important musician in the band was the guitarist in those bands, even as much as we might want to talk, you know, put down hair metal. Um, they, they all, they all had to have a virtuoso guitarist. Right. Um, so yeah, that's Eddie, Eddie, basically that's the other massive, massive, uh, you know, testimony to, to his importance is that he, he started a cottage industry in shredders in bands. And he even started the cottage industry of causing, the likes of Joe Satriani and Steve Vai and, and instrumental albums and Marty Friedman and Jake, Jason Becker and, uh, you know, Michael Batio or whatever his name is, right? Uh, Joe Stump and all those guys. So, so you know, there's these parallel movements going on after Eddie where the guitar is super important all of a sudden because of him and it's his inspiration that caused that. Well, that's right. And to anyone who's just tuned in and sort of said, why aren't we mentioning Jeff Beck? The, the whole point, because obviously he's someone who has his own sound and he's developed that sound and reinvented himself over and over and over again with lots of different things. We're talking primarily about um, rock or metal guitarists during this period that were, were putting down the foundations to what came with Eddie Van Halen. And so and Jeff Beck really, apart Beck, Beck, Beck Bogart and a Peach, he really, didn't really want to go down the hard rock route. So he's he went off through jazz and then came back through. But obviously he could play as many notes as anyone else if he wanted to and had that unique sound. But you're right, people like Robin Trower were more... Well, if I just interject at this point, because I think we get to the 80s and 90s and, and heavy metal guitarists become, when you ask them in interviews who they were influenced by, they go back and it's heavy metal bands. But a lot of the people we talk about, whether it is Ted Nugent, Robin Trower, Billy Gibbons or Richie Blackmore, Jimmy Page, probably Eddie Van Halen, Ronnie Montrose. If you ask all of them, they'll all go back to the blues or soul, which I know you said when we spoke last that if it comes from the blues, it's not heavy metal. Um, or but but all of those all of those guitarists that we've talked about so far, Buck Dharma, all of them had a lot of feel in their playing, and even Eddie Van Halen, although he could play a million notes. He actually was quite reserved when you listen to the Van Halen albums. He could have probably gone further, but he was he left he left a lot of space. If you think about things like Mean Streets from Fair Warning, at the end of that, he could have easily just filled that with millions of notes. But it's it's a fantastic exercise in reserve and space as he just comes up with that one note riff, and then the guitar kind of looks, weaves in and out at the end as they go into the fade. I think that shows that he was. He was serving the song more than serving his ego or thinking, how good will I look when yeah. people look back at this? And humorously, a lot of a lot of the a lot of the 80s guitarists, who who do they cite as one of their favorite uh, influences? I've done many interviews and heard this many times. Ace Freely. He he was so important to a lot of those guys, right? That's yeah, um, kind of interesting. I'm not talking about the hair metal guys, but you know, you you think about the Anthrax guys and and uh, you know, um, Dimebag uh, as well. You know, a lot of guys loved Ace and they grew up on Ace, and and they're talking about just the mania and the fondness that that you know everybody had for Kiss. It was their first band that they got into, and they you know they went nuts for them and stuff. But yeah, you're right. A lot of these guys will will mention blues guys. Peter Green comes up all the time, right? as as a super influence on these guys but uh yeah i but i think i think the overall biggest name that you hear period is jimmy page i i think jimmy page is the one name you hear the most as uh, as the biggest influence and, and richie blackmore definitely a lot as well yeah I, I feel that richie blackmore carried on influencing people 
um, way up through the 80s and into the 90s when he started to develop more of that kind of snake charmer Egyptian type modal scales and stuff in his playing. Whereas, I mean, but Jimmy Page, it, it felt like he tailed off. You know, he he start, he tailed off towards the end of the 70s in saying anything new. And I don't mean any disrespect to Led Zeppelin fans, but he he struggled to 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 reinvent himself when Led Zeppelin ground to a halt. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, 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 and what we, yeah, what we love him for and what all these future rock stars of the late seventies and eighties love him for is, is that first, you know, four or five albums, you know, at physical graffiti, people love physical graffiti, but it's, it's mainly, it's really in terms of being a, a guitar hero, it's, it's one, two and four, basically. I mean, do you think that, well, I think we should say at this point something about the producers, uh, which because you've just made me think about that with Jimmy Page, because in some ways the first Jim, the first Led Zeppelin album, which I know Jimmy produced, but he created a sound on that. When you listen to that now, it's when did that come out? 1969? Recording 68? Yeah. It's just amazing the the vision he had with how to use the studio to create the songs on on that album and i think it's more than just the songs a, a lot of them are blue standards acoustic stuff it's the sound of the album and maybe then people like ted templeman obviously must have been listening to what you could create from an album um because it's the sound of the first montrose album that 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 yeah. has cemented its legacy and it's the sound of the first van halen album again ted templeman um yeah. you know and he obviously he Ted Templeman could do that with anything on the Warner Brothers label because he was the in-house producer, couldn't he? The Doobie Brothers, they all sound mm. absolutely perfect. But he had he obviously had an ear for of for guitars. And, you know, go back to Rick Derringer or Ted Nugent or whatever, or Brock Dharma, those first Blue Oyster Cult albums don't have that no. production sound to, no. to almost to that, so it's almost like the producer of creating that heavy metal guitar sound hadn't quite been de- perfected in the eighties. Of course, bands like Rat and Winger, the, the, getting that that sound for heavy metal at that point was 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 easier to do. It had been yeah. done. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think any of the Derringer albums, any of the Ted Nugent albums, or any of them. Uh, so who else did we mention there? Oh, but yeah, Blue Oyster Cult. I don't think any of those sound good at all. Um, but that Montrose album, yeah, that that basically for 1973, uh, for for rock or hard rock or heavy metal, uh, that sounded as good as anything all the way up to the end of the decade, at least. And then after that. You can do whatever you want. After that, it becomes preference, aesthetic. You know, you you now can do whatever you want sort of thing. I, I've even said that about 1973 as a pivotal point uh, because I always think of Dark Side of the Moon and I think of the first Montrose album as, uh, okay, everything's perfect now. Everything from here forward is just choice, <laughs> right? Um, you know, what, what do you want to do with it sort of thing? I, I think Aerosmith Rocks is an amazing sounding album as well. Um, but yeah, Ted, Ted really doesn't have any great sounding albums and Blue Oyster Cult, none, you know, until Mirror, you know, I've, I have a weird soft spot for mirrors. I think it sounds really good, but um, yeah, it's, it's funny. And, and just to, just to, you know, uh, go back to your Jimmy Page point um, and, and thinking about my chat with Billy Gibbons yesterday, because he correctly actually noticed this and, and I was surprised, but he, but he said, um, cause I prompted him on it saying, in in Europe, you do have that classical tr- tradition, and in in uh, in America, you don't have the classical tradition. You only have the blues tradition, right? So there's this void, uh, missing the classical stuff. And every classical, you know, legend is is from either you know Britain or Europe or Austria or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, where was I going? Oh yeah, so so with it with the first Led Zeppelin album, I think you get three things. You get um, uh, an improvement on the British folk boom. You get an improvement on the British blues boom while staying in it, and you also get the the the, the nascent heavy metal. So you get those three things going, and all of that makes it exciting. Along with, as you say, the sound, and uh, and this this pretty mercurial lead singer. Well, 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 totally. I think again, that's the other thing about the first Montrose album. It brought along Sammy Hager, and he was a 
to hear that kind of vocals when we were so used to listening to Robert Plant, Ian Gillen, uh, you know, Paul Rogers, uh, Roger Daltrey, you know, to have. So I think the other reason why the first Montrose album made such an impact is that for, for us in the UK, they were all unknown people. You know, this wasn't a yeah. band like made up of people. Oh, he used to be in this band. I know it was in some some ways with um, Edgar Winter, but majoritively we just it, so it's a brand new band with every member of the band um, seemed to be absolutely perfect. And, you know, Rock Candy, the, the drums were a bit like John Bonham, weren't they? And, and Danny Carmassi and uh, Bill Church, the bass on a Bad Motor Scooter. It was bubbling along, very well produced. So all of a sudden, for us in the UK, all of these four these four guys, their names were known to us, yeah. you know, all of a sudden. So when the next one came out, where it faltered a bit, you know, so I like it now, but it faltered at the time because we wanted Montrose 2. And we yeah. got paper money, which opened up completely differently to what we expected. Yeah, yeah. And we didn't get, we didn't get, I, you know, I've got the fire was the opening of side two, which was actually left over from the first album, if I'm right. And it was, oh, and then of course, uh, Ronnie then decided to produce the third one himself, which Ted Templeman went out of the picture, doesn't have the, doesn't have the, the sound you know, it yeah. would have been things like Black Train and the f- opening track. It would have sounded fantastic with Ted Templeman's work. Yeah. And Jack Douglas is a great producer, but he's but he's not as good as Ted and, and Jump On It again was another slide, which yeah. is why, you know, um, you know, we were looking for something before Eddie came along that gave that level of excitement. And you, you mentioned Kiss earlier. And I suppose I should mention them because they were massive at this point. Well, they'd be massive forever, but in the UK, they didn't. We didn't really, uh, we didn't really grasp Kiss until the eighties. Really, mm-hmm. we just didn't. yeah. They're, they're a very American centric band, so so they were big, you know, for us as kids. So I was thirteen when Destroyer came out, and I was there for actually. I got every single Kiss album as a new release, starting with the first one. So so so, but they were basically big from seventy five through to seventy nine. Uh, over here in a big way but yeah everybody loved ace right and ace actually has an interesting sound of his own which is sort of a um a very combative guttural strangling the neck uh kind of um old rock and roll it's a little bit of that ted nugent thing you know aces in influences are all the same boring standards everybody mentions sort of thing it's <laughs> not a good answer when you ask ace that it's 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 like very predictable right um but but yeah, you know, and it's funny, you know, you you, you think about uh, doing these books about people always say, oh, you just do a book on your own, the top guitar solos of all time. And I I just don't like the idea at all because there's millions and millions of guitar solos. I always tell people that, you know what, the best guitar solos of all time, just pick the last five Europe albums. Um, there, There's probably... 15 to 20 guitar solos there that you could argue are the best guitar solos of all time, John Norm or whatever. Right. Um, but the reason I bring that up is that everybody mentions comfortably numb hotel, California and kiss strange ways. Every time those, those three come up. Um, so it's, it's, so Ace definitely had an influence. But like you, you've just recently spoken to Billy Gibbons and obviously he had a very defined blues Gibson sound throughout the seventies, but it, even I would say he didn't really define it and fine tune it. And actually to the eighties with Eliminator is when most people of my peer group latched onto um, ZZ Top was that point. And then after that, that sound, that which he has, has become more, more defined, I think. But I listen to all the old ZZ Top albums, but it's from the eighties onwards where Billy Gibbons' sound is kind of like, I go, oh, that, I know where that is. And a bit like mentioned at the very start of this video, Leslie West, he kind of went through the 70s, obviously, with Mountain, but it was only his, his later albums where he developed this really fat Gibson bluesy metal mm-hmm. sound where he, he managed to bridge um, those two genres together really well without being, while being a blues guitarist, essentially, but being, but kind of metalizing his sound as he, as he got older. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love Billy. I mean, I always say my three favorite guitarists of all time are uh, Brian May, Kim Mitchell, and Billy Gibbons. And Billy, so I, I've I did a podcast episode on this, um, and I've talked about this before about how to make the blues interesting for for metalheads, right? 
Ancient and and it's cool. this is this long thing like Led Zeppelin started it. Yeah. And maybe if you like Mountain and Cactus, I'm not big fans, but you could say that. But you could say there's blues in there. Aerosmith definitely did it. So Aerosmith is like Led Zeppelin or Rolling Stones on steroids, like the new improved version. Right. Yeah. But I always talk about uh, definitely that, you know, the, the two bands that go together absolutely are ZZ Top and Fog Hat. So the idea is, you know, just like Led Zeppelin one, the idea is um, we've got some blues. I don't care. I don't even like the blues, but they they've got met. They've got metal riffs as well. They've got, they're adding that in. All right. And in later years, I always cite clutch as a, as a great example of just this pounding heavy band, but you can tell it's got real earthy roots to it sort of thing. And with Billy, um, uh, bar none i mean go up to the rhythmine album from 97 and mescalero from 2012 yeah, man yeah. the guitar sounds on those are so crushing and heavy but you know he is this consummate consummate blues guy so that so to me why i always have him on my top three is he's the absolute heaviest you can possibly get and be a traditional blues guitarist like his sound is so you know what's that thing they always stick on their albums tone taste and tenacity or something <laughs> like that right um but yeah i i just i just love what those guys did even later on um so yeah those two albums in particular are just so crushingly crushingly heavy yeah I yeah i totally agree and it is a kind of a very similar to sound to what leslie west had at that time as well but you're right the the, the later zz top album it really brings in this huge blues metal um sound it's good to mention brian may as well because we were talking earlier about guitarists who put a solo on a on an album thinking it's okay to do that of course brighton brighton rock um brian may did that in 1974 with sheer heart attack which was that was also way ahead of its time um but queen queen were able whereas whereas we were talking earlier about Bands thinking, oh, I'm going to make you know an album just full of metal tracks or whatever. Queen were a band that were able to do that, scoop up lots of rock fans, and then bring in pop or bits of jazz or anything, and scoop up all of those fans as well and alienate nobody. So, so they were totally, they totally different animal in that they 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 just crossed over every genre as if it didn't exist. Um, so they are different yeah. in that respect. The other thing he did that's interesting as a bridge to Eddie Van Halen is he quite often soloed without putting a rhythm guitar track behind it, right? Yes. So it made you pay attention to his solo more. His solos are amazing, right? Um, he's got various things to his sound. That you know, I, I'd say I'd say the two biggest things to his sound that I just love so much are the are the massive um, overdubbed harmony solos. That's one. And the other is, is the, is that, is that heavy scratching sound you get from the, whatever Pence piece that he uses as a pick or whatever, yeah, where, yeah, where he yeah. does some crazy scrapes, right? Some, yes. some really cool things. And, and yeah, some, some of the heaviest riffs um, that you could ever, you know, imagine in the seventies. I mean, literally they've, they've got probably, you know, you, you could stick about four of their songs in the, in the heaviest, 50 songs of the of the 70s right modern time rock and roll stone cold crazy yeah Shire yeah Attack, uh, yeah ogre Backle and stuff like that but i think that going back to the the premise of the of this talk about montrose and van halen is that because it's interesting talking about queen is that the the riffs as you say really really heavy but there's something about montrose and the first van halen album that the songs were incredibly well, i suppose simple and very accessible you know the 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 way that they were the songs were arranged um uh, make it last last track side two on the first montrose album you can hear it's, it's as if ronnie montrose is sitting four feet in front of you you can hear the clunk of the plectrum against the the strings and the and the pickups mm -hmm. and that kind of in your face production was is quite rare now um i, I would say uh, even yeah. we go back to hearing Tony Omi scrape, hearing his, his fingers squeak across the strings on the first on the Paranoid album. Everything is a bit more kind of doctored in a way. And Andy Van Halen, the first album, although there's tons of reverb on that, you have a feel that you are witnessing in your mind's eye just just one guy plugged into an amp. It just this space around the instruments isn't there it's yeah. i mean going back to production now but there are gaps between each 
each each player that you don't tend to get on a lot of albums. Except it's funny as kids, as as being absolutely uncompromising metalheads, um, the songs we liked on Van Halen were the super complicated ones, right? So, were, it, yeah. so it was those heavy ones because immediately I remember sitting there in in my buddy Forest Tubes, you know, listening on a beautiful big Yamaha 3020 amplifier with Bose 901s, like just this, this crazy, you know, aircraft carrier of a of a stereo, listening to that album for the first time. And you know, immediately what we compared a couple of those songs to was Virgin Killer and Dark Lady. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, that, yeah, it, it yeah, was like, a, yeah, it, it was yeah. the only Teutonic music you yeah. heard in America from America from American band. No, it's it's very true because 1978 we got Rainbow had released Long Live Rock and Roll, which was it was okay, but the production was a bit. It wasn't, you know, that exciting. He's Blackmore's sound seemed to be more hidden in the mix. Who are you by the Who? You know, it felt felt a little bit like they'd come back to form. Perhaps there was obsession by UFO, which was good, but not quite as good as the one that preceded it. So, we were, and of course, Never Say Die by Black Sabbath, which was not one of their best. Um, and then this unknown foursome called Van Halen appears with an album that's just ticks every single box. And of course, I was I saw them on that first tour. And Black Sabbath did not stand a chance. Right. They were just destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> funny. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't see it. I've, I've heard so many stories about it, but you're right. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah. yeah. But, and, and then we mention one other band that uh, the, the Van Halen that could have and should have, um, we got the first yesterday and today album as a new release oh. in 76. And I got the first at the second yesterday and today album struck down in 77 as a new release. And um, I remember the, the very first album trade me and my buddy Forrest ever did. And we, and these things got more complex over time, but one of us bought Virgin killer at the exact on the exact same day and came back and played them. We bought Virgin Killer on the exact same day as we bought Yesterday and Today One. So they were both 76 albums. And I liked his better and he liked mine better and we just swapped. Uh, so that was kind of funny, right? Um, but so 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 the, the wild thing is when you get to Struck Down, Struck Down is like Van Halen too. It is so amazingly dramatic and the, the band chemistry and the molten sound and the guitar hero stuff on that. I mean, literally struck down is, is the blueprint for Van Halen as much oh, as Montrose, Montrose is. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, it really is. Cause obviously for, for us in the UK, it was earth shaker from 81. Was it where it really opened up the world for, for Y and T. But see what happened is, is they were on the old label and uh and didn't do well on london so they had the 76 album the 77 album and then they had that long break up to earth shaker which is 79 right um and they're on a m by that point and you know the whole metal world has changed by that point but 77 you you listen to a lot of those songs on on uh, earth shaker and you're hearing basically an absolutely top flight van halen chemistry going on and on these heavy you know scary pioneering loose very loose songs and and this molten crazy crazy production and it's literally you know i i honestly i honestly hear yeah i i would say 50 50 on that van halen album you're hearing 50 percent struck down and 50 percent montrose well that's that's brilliant i should go and i should go and play that later just because i know we're bouncing around but another album another band um don't want to go too far off topic, but another band that came out around that time um, that meant a lot to to me and a, and a guitarist I really loved was uh, Riot. Was it Mark Rail with uh, Narita and obviously the the, uh, the uh, Riots? Was it Rock City before that? Because he yeah, Rock City down. 77, Narita 79, Fire yeah. Down Under is like 80. Yeah. yeah, 80, 81. Yeah. Because he he fine-tuned his whole style and went through power metal, didn't he? Much like much further into the mid-80s yeah. and beyond. Yeah. which was, again, was very – I think that's the other thing about guitarists like that and going back to Rick Derringer is is they're able to reinvent themselves or re move around whatever's going ar around them. I think people like Ronnie Montrose and Rick Derringer didn't probably s hang around long enough to develop a good following and a good community of, of good fan base around them before they moved on. They were too busy, you know, dipping in and out and thinking, perhaps this will work. Maybe this will work better. Um, because there is because Eddie Van Halen, first Van Halen, it just took off. 
So they didn't need to really think about what should we do next. We'll just tweak what we're doing. But as you say, Montreux's album, it didn't sell in in the UK or the US. So I can, I, I can, I suppose to be fair, he must have looked around and thought, well, we can't do that again because it didn't sell. Um, we need to we need to tweak it without realizing, without the use of social media and the internet, that actually you you've sown the seeds to something that actually could be huge. I mean, yeah. if they had done another Montrose album similar to the first one, do you think they? Do you, what do you think? I mean, would that have just blown it, taken off beyond? Absolutely, because. You had the songs, you had the production, you had this amazing lead singer. And that was one of the problems with Ronnie. He had a big ego and he was really jealous of Sammy Hager getting a lot of the limelight, right? Yeah. Being the lead singer and being such a great lead singer. Um, so that was a problem. But yeah, I imagine, you know, that's that's probably the most clear cut case you can you can think of, of, of a band that, that would have just been huge, right? Because metal, metal was essentially... The way we look at it in North America is that hard rock was very in vogue from, from about that first Ted Nugent album or Get Your Wings, Aerosmith, so 74 into Toys in the Attic, 75, Ted Nugent, 75, right up until about 78. And then and then there's this weird thing where everybody goes pop at the same time and it all ticked us off. And we we took our $4.99 down to the store and we bought Star's Attention Shopper, Shoppers or Derringer, you know, if I yeah, weren't yeah, so yeah. romantic, I shoot you or or like the Mellow Moxie album or the Mellow yeah, Tease yeah. album or the Mellow Blue Oyster Cult album or the, or the jokey Ted Nugent album album or whatever so so it was funny um there was this narrative that in 78 and 79 hard rock is now out of vogue and then the new wave of british heavy metal happens but for the for that short time and and a little bit of it is uh is oh it must be because punk is important or new wave is important or pop or power pop or whatever you want to call it but and you know and kiss of course went yeah. mellow as well everybody everybody kind of did right blue oyster cult was accused of that for mirrors yeah um even though they're all about the same mellow, but um, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's funny. So Montrose could have ridden a wave, you know, right up, up until 78 with three albums, they would have been massive. Yeah, they would have been as well, because there was, as you say, everyone around them was, was also concerned about which way they should be going. Um, There was still this in built thing that you can't really put out an album full of, you know, full on metal tracks because it won't do as well as, you know, if you have a bit of variety on there. Again, going back to Scene After Scene by Judas Priest, you know, great album, but even they, 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 they weren't as much as Rob Halford says we are Judas Priest heavy metal. He wasn't yeah. always um, you know, they themselves didn't really turn that dial until the 80s. And and what about the, what about the rule of album covers? Like, look at that. That's so heavy metal looking, right? Hey, look, look how heavy metal these guys look, right? So so yeah. So so we talk about how all through the seventies there was there's no heavy metal look, and and you know we always talk about Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden being kind of the first, or Judas Priest inventing the the aesthetics and everything. Yeah. So you know I I always talk about how Black Sabbath basically dressed like the Eagles. There's no difference, right? All, all through the whole time, um, so you don't you don't really get a heavy metal uh, aesthetic uh, in in the way the bands look or the album covers or whatever until you. Well, get you, you don't do. I know one of your favorite Sabbath albums is Sabotage, and if you look at you know uh, if you look at what I mean, let's leave um, Bill Ward out of this, but even look at uh, you know Geezer with his umbrella and his nice jacket. It's just it's just so not what you expect for one of the greatest heavy metal albums of all time. But again, it was that, that the image hadn't been brought across over to lay on top of the music at that point, really. Yeah. Yeah. So to recap, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll say yeah. again, you know, I, I think, I think you get an amazing artist an alien in Jimi Hendrix, you get yeah. a guy who's just all about art in Eddie Van Halen. I mean, he, he was he was creative to the point of of it almost being a slight mental illness, you know, building those thousands and thousands of tapes sitting there that no one's ever heard, you know, sitting in 5150. He he is an absolute pure artist. Jimi Hendrix was a pure artist. And I think every single guy we've talked about in the middle, whether they're from America or from from the UK, they're just mere mortals. Yes, I, I I agree with you. Um, with the with the gift of hindsight, from where I am now at the grand lofty age that I am, I can see now that you know that Jimi Hendrix, he had no he had nothing in front of him to to use as a template or anything. He was just creating the future in each moment himself, without any input from anyone around him. 
Um, so, and I have to also say that, you know, Van Halen, you know, Eddie Van Halen in 1978 was also about to do the same thing. So, yeah. Well, thanks. Thank you very, very much. It's been a fantastic um, chat, Martin, again. Uh, it's really good how we bounced and included so many different uh, <laughs> guitarists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there are, there's so many albums for you all out there to listen to, <laughs> to get a really good um, education on the history of rock music or heavy metal, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're sitting on. So thank you very much. And um, hopefully we can do another another one of these again in the future. Absolutely, Phil. Yeah, I, I had a blast. It was great. Thank you very much. Well, I'll see you very soon. Thank you. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Well, how fantastic was that? Um, thank you again to Martin Popoff um, for his time and for a fantastic chat. I think we covered so many guitarists there from the 70s and 80s and absolutely fantastic. And there's quite a few albums um, for you all there to to explore and get into. But if you are a, a fan of Rick Derringer or you want to know more about him, then I'd recommend um, these two box sets from Cherry Red. Um, which hopefully you can see there, um, which I've reviewed on the Nasbini Magazine channel on the website and e everywhere else as well. But that was absolutely brilliant. Um, there's so many guitarists and so many fantastic albums there to explore. So thank you again to Martin Popoff. Remember, you can go to martinpopoff.com to find all his latest books and what projects he's working on. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And please subscribe to, to YouTube, to the website, become a patron, become a YouTube member. But it's great to see you here and I shall talk to you again on my next video.